Hey there, everyone. Jill here in the pickle jar, and I have my friend here, Michelle. Michelle is coming to us from the United States. She lives in Connecticut, and Michelle is going to share with us her story um, with adrenal insufficiency. Now, her story with adrenal insufficiency just started a mere six weeks ago in December of 2023, but her story started a long time before that. And she's going to share that story with us that started probably about 15 plus years ago with multiple autoimmune challenges that she was dealing with and just finally getting a hold of when she was diagnosed with cancer in June of 2023. Um, so Michelle, welcome so much to the Pickle Jar. I'm so excited that you reached out to me to share your story with us today. Thanks, Jill. Nice to be here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's get started. First, what I want you to do is I want you, I almost fell off my stability bolt here. Um, <laughs> I want, um, I would love for you to sh um, share with our audience a little bit about yourself outside of the last 15 years, that journey. Tell us a little bit of Michelle outside of the autoimmune life. Sure. So my name is Michelle Douglas, and I am a certified professional dog trainer and dog behavior consultant. That's my dog, Addie. <laughs> Her name is Addie. <laughs> oh, well, well, yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Her name is actually Adiva, um, A-D-I-V-A which means gentle, gracious, and pleasant in both Jewish or Hebrew and Arabic, which Ooh, I thought I like that. Cool. I like that. But we call her Addie <laughs> and we have, and she's about, uh, she's 10, 10 years old. So long before this, <laughs> she was Addie. Um, and so I've been, um, you know, really active in the dog training world. Um, I was, I'm a past president of the association of professional dog trainers. Um, and, um, that's, that's been my life. I also am married for the last 20 years. I have an 18 year old son who is a marine biology major and I have a 15 year old daughter. Both my kids play hockey and that's been very, you know, consuming of my life up until this past year or so. Very good. Well, thank you so much for um, coming on to the podcast today to share your story. Um, so like I said, is Michelle's story started a long time ago, very recently with adrenal insufficiency. So Michelle, why don't you start by first walking us through before June of 2023? Mm -hmm. So um, my history of autoimmune goes back about 15 years, um, around the same time, maybe in between my two kids. Um, but definitely I started tracking my symptoms after my daughter was born uh, because um, every doctor I went to just said it was all in my head. So I'm sure that a lot of people can relate to that um, with autoimmune stuff. That's kind of those invisible diseases where yeah. you just have pain, you, um, you know, don't, just don't feel right. And, you know, I had all the diagnoses, the fibromyalgia and the chronic fatigue syndrome and I had non-specific autoimmune markers in my blood that didn't really point to any specific illness, but they were there. So they said something's going on, but it's just fibromyalgia. And, and that's not, that doesn't work for me. I'm not like, okay, yeah, it's a, it's a real thing. I can vouch for that. It, there was pain, but it did but tell me why. And so I probably went through 15 or, or so um, doctors in like nine years time that just told me that I was just getting older. I was in my thirties, <laughs> but it was all in my head or I just needed to take this pill, whatever the pill was of the month. And um, I finally had a PA in a walk-in clinic who told me that I had Lyme disease and I had had it for a very long time. And um I wasn't testing positive for Lyme on a Western blot because I had it for so long that my body wasn't fighting it anymore. So I wasn't producing antibodies, okay. but I had, you know, if we went through the questionnaire in the book, how, how, why can't I can't, why can't I get better or whatever that book is called by Dr. Horowitz. I had like a score, like off the chart, I had Lyme disease and he actually diagnosed me officially with Lyme, Babesia, Bartonella and Brucella. And so for two years, we cycled through different antibiotics as well as natural remedies and supplements. And I got better. I got maybe 75 to 80% better. Some of my symptoms went away and never came back. Some of them went away and then crept back into my life mm -hmm. over time. Um, and then 
in 2022, in October, I decided to change my diet again. <laughs> I had tried various things, vegetarian, lots of plant-based through the years, nothing worked, everything made it worse. In October of 2022, I decided to try carnivore. And um, I, I eliminated, I think the important part is I eliminated everything processed mm -hmm. and I eliminated all sugars and sweeteners. And I don't think that, I do think that carnivore works for me, but I think that um, just eliminating those things could probably work for a lot of people. On day five, I woke up for the first time in 15 years with no pain. And I On just find that incredible. When you told me that the other day, when you said for 15 years, you live with pain. Day. You know why it's, it's, and like you just said, like, you know, carnivore might not be for everybody. And if, you know, maybe, could you maybe just um, quickly tell everyone exactly what's involved in a carnivore diet? Like, sure. so carnivore for me was everything was animal based except my coffee because I didn't give <laughs> up my coffee. So the thing about the coffee though, was that I had to give up the sugar. So from October 24th of 2022, there has been no sugar in my coffee. And I try to get single source or single origin coffee as well mm -hmm. so that it's less a blended and less processed. There's less chance of mold in the coffee. Um, and I found a good actually grocery store brand that is single source and it's a little bit more expensive, but it's good. It tastes good. And, and I like it. And I put heavy cream in it. And I was for a time putting MCT oil in it as well. Um, to, to, cause I was trying to be in ketosis cause I also wanted to lose weight. So, um, carnivore does not necessarily mean a ketogenic diet because, uh, you have to get the fat ratio, right. To be in ketosis. So, um, for me, it was just really focusing on eating meats, mainly ruminant animals. So it would be beef and lamb, um, mostly beef for me, cause that's what I can get frugally, <laughs> um, bacon. Uh, was a staple. I kept bacon in the fridge all the time because if I wanted to snack on something, yep. a couple of pieces of bacon would satisfy that. And I wouldn't get, I wouldn't snack uh, other than that. <laughs> um, butter. I used a lot of butter and upped my fat a lot um, because I wasn't having fiber. So if you're not ingesting fiber, you want to make sure you keep everything moving. Yeah. And I keep that fat that is <laughs> up your fat <laughs> up your fat it works wonders <laughs> um and eggs lots of eggs yeah. so um and we have a couple of local farms near me that luckily i can get um eggs actually farm fresh eggs yeah. at the same price as the grocery store so um i i'm getting a lot of local meats i'm getting a lot of local eggs and that's pretty much it. also chicken wings um chicken was not an everyday thing, but if I wanted something different that day, then I would have chicken wings or chicken thighs. I would try to do the the thighs because they're a little bit higher in fat. Yeah. Um, but the thing about the ruminant animals is that that you get your your vitamins and minerals and nutrients that you would get from vegetables. You get those from ruminant animals because they convert the plants for you. <laughs> so that's what I learned about carnivore. And, um, that's what I stuck to. It was really, I didn't find it difficult at all, especially after I woke up with no pain I mean, and the, the inflammation continued to go down from there too. So exactly. And I think when you find nutritionally, what makes your body happy. And I always tell people when, you know, when, you know, you know, when you're sick, we know we're sick. We know there's something wrong inside and you know, when your body's happy with what you're eating and, and, uh, you know, for you to say that for really for 15 years, you chased your wellness and your health to feel better and to change something really as simple and something that you had power of, of your nutrition. And like you said, you tried a bunch of other things and it just, it just wasn't jiving with your body. It just wasn't working. And when you found that, that tune that your body liked, things changed like yeah. completely. And that's very, and I think you nailed it on the head too. It's, it's the process stuff. If anything, people need to start getting rid of the process stuff. And if you feel a little bit better, then you're on to something. Your body, our bodies don't like processed foods. Um, it's hard on our bodies. So um, it's a really, really I good think, place to start. Yeah. I think that anything that comes out of a box and then anything that's cooked in seed oils. Yeah. And so soy was, I knew soy was a trigger for inflammation for me for a very long time. Um, and, you know, just some of the things that got better for me, I got off of my meds. 
So I, I almost all the way off. I had reduced my, I cut in half my medication for GERD, prantoprazole. I was on it for 15 years and I cut it in half twice, um, was ready to come off of it in the next couple of months when I found the cancer. Um, and I had reduced um, an antibiotic that I was on prophylactically to keep uh, some other, the, another autoimmune um, issue up under control, which is called hydradenitis supertiva, which okay. is basically boils where you have sebaceous glands. So in your, usually in your armpits, um, anywhere you sweat, you can get like a boil and, um, endometriosis symptoms improved greatly on the carnivore diet. I had really painful periods and that almost entirely went away. Now I did have a Mirena, um, IUD but um, that had not been controlling the endometriosis symptoms effectively, but on the carnivore diet, it was. Um, and yeah, it was eight months. I had, eight, and I had energy, energy through the roof. Like I started walking every day. I started exercising. I had the motivation to do that because I had all this energy. And, and so, like, and you mentioned too about the, the ruminant animals, like you were also you know, not only did you take out the processed stuff, like you said, you're getting your vitamins and minerals and you're giving your body what it needed to have energy, mm -hmm. right? And then giving your body that fuel, right? So that's was life-changing, it sounds like for you. It really was. And I was feeling so good. And it led and, you to another life-changing moment. <laughs> and so as I lost some weight and my body started to change and be more lean, um, I found a lump in my breast. And so went to the doctor and, uh, within, you know, three weeks I had a diagnosis, um, in July of 2023, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and it's a metastatic triple negative invasive ductal carcinoma. So, um, triple negative breast cancer is one of the most aggressive types of breast cancer. And, um, so that was, a you know, a lovely scary experience to to get that and you see they put the labs up on the on a screen you're in a conference room when you go and meet with the the breast surgeon and i think she had a nurse and a social worker in the room too and she put it up on the screen and my husband's looking at it, it says negative 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 for the hormone um tests and he's like oh shoot <laughs> and um you know so that was scary but um, very quickly, like everything moved very quickly from there. Okay. And, um, I continued on a carnivore diet for the first 12 weeks of my treatment, which I think actually made the symptoms of, you know, the side effects of chemotherapy a lot less. I, I didn't have a lot of side effects in the first 12 weeks. Um, I had a little bit of fatigue, like I definitely each week got more pronounced and, um, I had, I experienced nausea maybe twice for an hour in those 12 weeks. So I really didn't have a lot of um, nausea. And um, the, the only thing I did notice was that I would have these autoimmune flares. So I'd have some, a little bit of joint pain or I'd have the um, hydradenitis would flare up and that coincided with the immunotherapy. So our plan was, 20 weeks of chemotherapy. The first 12 were two particular drugs and the last eight were two other drugs for chemo. But during that time, it was every three weeks, there was also immunotherapy with um, Keytruda. And the, so I had, I think I had five Keytruda treatments. And there were a few things that I noticed. One was the hydradenitis. One was um, during I think the third treatment with Keytruda, I got a rash and they, they thought I, it was an allergic reaction to the chemo at the time and gave me extra steroids, <laughs> but um, because they give steroids with, um, with everything, right? Like that's part of the treatment. Well, they right? do for the first two treatments, but if you don't have a reaction in those first two treatments, then they actually stop giving you steroids. But when we went to the second session or the second phase of chemo where it was those stronger meds for those last eight weeks, that was what they called the red devil, which is doxorubicin and cytoxin. Um, and that 
um, first treatment of that red devil, they did give me uh, steroids. I had a pre-medication um, dexamethasone, six milligrams injection, injection with that round of chemo. There was also immunotherapy with that round. Okay. And then they sent me home with dexamethasone and I'm naming these uh, steroids because of your audience. <laughs> um, well, yes, we all know them. <laughs> dexamethasone, um, they gave me uh, four milligrams for days two, three, and four of the cycle orally at home in the morning. And um, I didn't sleep when I was on Dex. You, you would have had lots of energy on that Dex. <laughs> yeah, I would have kept you yeah. up. So, um, so that was the, the plan. And with that first session of doxorubicin on day six, which was, I saw my treatment was Tuesday. So the Sunday after I woke up and I felt kind of, really dizzy. I was tingly all over and I felt like I was kind of out of my body or leaving my body. Um, that's how I described it to the oncologist. And, um, I don't know, I, I, I felt very otherworldly. I went and had a bowel movement and felt a little better. And so I just went to lay down. Um, the other thing that I noticed when we switched to the doxorubicin was that I slept all the time. Um, so other than when I was on dexamethasone and I could not sleep. Right. <laughs> so from day it was two, three, and four. So day five, Saturday, I slept from the time I woke up, I would just move to the couch and fall asleep. And I would sleep there until it was time to do something. And when I, uh, you know, even on weekdays in between, I would wake up and bring my daughter to school, go to sleep until it was time to go pick her up. And, um, and then go to sleep until it was dinner time and then go to sleep until it was time to move to the right. bed and go to bed. And so um, those were the two kind of red flags. And so we, I call that my mini crisis. Um, they just assumed I was dehydrated because I was not eating as much that that chemo made everything taste horrible. Well, and you're going and, through the red devil. So there's probably going to yeah. be nasty. It sounds like to me, if they call it the red devil, you're expecting something nasty something yes. something and nasty. that's what they told oh, me right? they said it's right. gonna be bad you're gonna feel like you have the fl have the flu for two months it, but it's gonna be worth it because it's gonna really right. kick your cancer out of your body and um I lost my train of thought there for a second so <laughs> <laughs> that's okay <laughs> So yeah, they, they thought, so I called when that happened, right. mini I crisis, called, we are a mini crisis. Yes. yes mini crisis. <laughs> when that happened, I called the cancer center because they have an on-call physician who called me back and said, you're probably dehydrated. You should think about coming in for IV hydration. And I'm like, yes. Okay. Called Monday morning. They didn't get me in that Monday. I didn't go in until the Tuesday after. And so this was a week after the chemo already. Um, but I went in for IV hydration. I slept during that IV hydration too. And my blood pressure was so low. They actually wouldn't let me go home until they spoke with a cardiologist. Wow. Another red flag, right? <laughs> so they, they, um, they had the car, they called the cardiologist and he, he said that, um, he thinks I was just dehydrated and it's fine. Just send me home. Uh, he had done a full workup by the way they do uh, an echocardiogram when you start chemotherapy because they know it's going to be taxing on your heart. Okay. So, um, I had been referred to a cardiologist because there was an abnormality on my echocardiogram that could potentially be indicative of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy after the full workup, including a stress test and an MRI, they said, I'm borderline, but not an, it's not, um, really considered uh hyper hypertrophic cardiomyopathy but because my heart had such a high had such a high heart rate he put me on a beta blocker anyway because he said we don't want your heart to be working so hard especially going through chemo so i was on uh, metoprolol 50 milligrams once a day and um i've been taking that and i actually did my heart rate, according to my Apple watch went down and I started to feel better and, um, I was, you know, less tired. <laughs> yeah. So it was doing its job. And, um, the cardiologist had, had seen me as a patient. So he was confident in saying that 
he felt I was just dehydrated. And the hydration helped everything. And the hydration would help. So they sent me home and uh, I went back that Friday again for hydration. And, um, and then the following week on Tuesday, which was the second, so that's, it's, this chemo was every two weeks. Okay. I went in and met with the oncologist and I told him about this scary experience where I felt like I was leaving my body. And he said, um, sometimes you can feel like you're dying, but not really be dying. And I said, okay. And then I told him how I was sleeping all the time and that's all I could do. And it's really hard to stay hydrated. And he said, okay, we'll schedule you for hydration and we'll actually give you a bolus. So we'll give you a liter of fluids with your chemo this time. And if it happens again, then we'll talk about maybe reducing the dose or changing the plan. And um, he says, but you know what? I'm going to check your cortisol because the sleeping all the time, I don't like. And um, we got the result the next day. My cortisol was 0.8. And then do you know, because in Canada, we have different reference values. So do you know what the reference range is by chance? I could tell you. Do you? Uh, hold on one second. I'm assuming that's extremely low. <laughs> It is. And same thing, like you said, he, um, if you have a chance to find that, um, you know, like you said, like, he's like, I'm glad he had the, the sense to check your cortisol levels, but the cortisol and the hydration and the sleeping, um, those who are listening to this that have adrenal insufficiency, when you use the words, I feel like I was leaving my body. We all know what that feeling feels like. So there is multiple symptoms there that kind of led that there's something going on with your adrenal gland. So if you're going through something you know, similar to Michelle with um, cancer treatment or something like that. And, you know, this might be a possible concern. Adrenal glands are so easy to check, you know? So if your doctor hasn't said, you know what, we wasn't like Michelle's doctor and said, you know what, let's just check in on those cortisol because you're sleeping so much. Um, you know, don't just always assume it's the treatment going on. There could be some side effects that are going on that are a lot more devastating than that are going to be permanently part of your life as opposed to temporary during the treatment, right? Right. Yes. And that's, that's, that was the thing. Like a lot of the symptoms mimic what the side yes. effects of chemo yes. were. Yeah. And, right. uh, but they did, I mean, they know that this is a side effect of Keytruda to have adrenal insufficiency right. as an outcome. And so they were checking my cortisol when we first started. Okay, good. So okay. Um, my cortisol in the beginning, so in, on August 15th, my cortisol was 9.8. And I'll tell you the reference value Hold on, I have to get out of this. Back. The reference value is, so AM cortisol should be between 6 and 18.4. Oh, so and yours was down to 0.9 then, you said. <laughs> 0.8, yes. 0.8, 0.8 8. before. Oh, my. And then my, and, and it, that was at 10 AM. Okay. So, uh, and PM cortisol should be between 2.6 and 10.5. So that's what normal is. is yep. And mine, again, at the beginning was 9.8. Um, in September, it was 12. In uh, at the end of September, it was 10. October 17th, it was 19.1. And then November 27th, which was a week after this little mini crisis, last dose of Keytruda was 0.8. Wow. Um, and then they've tested it since then. And it's uh, it was 1.7 on January 2nd, wow. just to, to see if anything is changing. Um, and they tested it in the hospital too, which we haven't gotten to that part of the story. yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you've had what you feel is definitely been some type of a crisis, a signal from your adrenal glands that they're, you're struggling somehow. And, and you got this very extremely low cortisol reading extremely quickly into the treatment process. Um, yeah. So what were the next steps after that? So after that, um, what the oncologist did was he referred me to an endocrinologist and he um, prescribed me until I could have that appointment, hydrocortisone, 10 milligrams twice a day. Um, and he told me to take that instead of the dexamethasone on days two, three, and four after uh, chemo. Um, and so that wasn't enough. <laughs> that wasn't enough to bring the level to a point where my body could fight. And so what happened was I had that injection of dexamethasone, at least this is how it was explained to me by the endocrinologist. I had that injection of dexamethasone of six milligrams before chemo that Tuesday. That lasted me a few days. Yes. 
And so when we got to the weekend, I, I felt okay on this 10 milligrams of hydrocortisone twice a day, but I was tired, but I, I, I didn't feel better. Like right. I wouldn't say I felt like myself, but I felt okay. But when we got to Sunday morning, that day six, that's a doozy. That's, I guess, when your body's been trying to keep up and trying to keep up and it just says, okay, we're done. Yeah. I guess we're going to die now. Yeah. Well, and basically, so- yeah, like you said, you would have ran out of the dexamethasone. Um, mm-hmm. Do you know, and I don't know, um, do you know the conversion of dexamethasone to hydrocortisone? I know that dexamethasone is much it's stronger. Strong. Yeah. And so much six, longer lasting. So you said six milligrams of hydrocort of dexamethasone. Um, if you multiply that by four, that takes it to 24 milligrams equivalent of prednisone. And if you multiply that by four, that takes you up to hydrocortisone. So your six milligrams of dexamethasone was equivalent to about hundred milligrams of hydrocortisone. That's going to last you three days. So you ran out and then you had everything else going on and then there was nothing left in the tank and you needed it. <laughs> and I needed it because now my body's going to get slammed with it. Yes. The brunt of the chemo. Yes. And so on a Sunday morning, I started to get that same feeling again, tingly all over. The death feeling. Uh, yes. <laughs> the death <laughs> like feeling. leaving my body. I was the dizzy. Body, I'm like, yeah. and, and again, the last time I went to the bathroom and felt better. So I'm like, I need to get to the bathroom. So my husband walked me to the bathroom and he went to get the phone to call the oncologist or to, or to, to contact, to text the oncologist. We had a cell phone number. And he left my daughter with me in the bathroom, um, but he he could see me still. And he said that I, I, so I don't feel like I lost consciousness, but he said I was not there. And um, I I knew I was falling. I, everything felt like it was spinning. Like when you're really, really drunk and you're like, I, I, I need to lay on the floor yeah. because yeah. that's the only place I won't fall. And so I started to kind of lower myself to the floor. But he said that my arms were just hanging at my side from, you know, an outside perspective. And I, I passed out and fell off the toilet. And so he called 911 yeah. and uh, I had, I had an ambulance ride. So I tell people, you know, I checked that off the bucket list. I don't need to do that again. Yeah. I had an ambulance ride to the emergency <laughs> yeah. room. Um, and so in the emergency room, um, they gave me fluids they assumed I was dehydrated and that was my main problem. But also looking at my blood work, keep in mind, chemo is attacking all of my blood cells because it chemo attacks cells that replicate. And so my hemoglobin was also very low. So I was anemic. And so emergency room mentality is she's bleeding out. <laughs> so okay. they're doing CAT scans they're running their tests, they're going through their emergency room flow chart to find out what's going to kill me. And my husband is telling every single person from the EMT to the triage nurse to the the first uh, resident that we saw, we saw two different attending physicians in the ER. And he's like, her oncologist suspects adrenal insufficiency, she needs stress steroids, she needs stress steroids, everyone who came in the room, she needs stress steroids. And they're like, yeah, yeah, okay, but we need to find the bleed. Like we need to do this. And so he's texting my oncologist updates with my blood pressure and what's going on. And he's like, I just told doctor, whoever introduced themselves that she needs stress steroids. I just told this doctor. And then these are her blood pressures. He sent a picture of the screen that showed the last five. And um, my blood pressure after a liter of fluids was 88 over 37. Really low. Very, very. And uh, when he texted him that, he got the response back from my oncologist, have the doc, the head doctor in that room call me on my cell right now. And he went out to the nurse's station. He said, this is the phone number. This is her doctor. He's saying you need to call him now. now. The next person in the room says, we're going to give you stress steroids. It was six hours in the emergency room. This is Yale New Haven. This is, they should be on the ball. I, in my opinion, I feel like they should have known that what the words adrenal insufficiency. (laughs) 
asking me to touch my hair. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm shaking my head. As soon as those words come out of anyone's mouth, I have adrenal insufficiency. It should be instant. Oh, stress steroids, no matter what, whether you are bleeding out or not, if you're bleeding out, you need stress steroids to deal with it. Exactly. So we give her the stress. Person A, you do the stress, you do the steroids, while we try to figure out the rest of the story. Because if not, we're going to have more of a problem if we don't treat it all together because everything affects adrenal insufficiency when your body's under stress and you're and like bang on it's like when somebody comes in and says they're having a heart attack or a stroke they instantly know what to do adrenal insufficiency needs to be exactly the same way because we are in the same dire situation and we shouldn't sit for six hours and put our bodies under more stress and make the problem worse (laughs) yes and I think I think he was quoting you because when our doctor when my oncologist said adrenal insufficiency, she may be developing adrenal insufficiency, or actually what he said was she may be developing Addison's disease, which is fine because the treatment's the same. It should be type one and type two, in my opinion, as opposed, because adrenal insufficiency yeah, yeah. sounds mm-hmm. made up. <laughs> you know what? You're right. And that's one of the biggest challenges I have with it. It just sounds like you're just insufficient. I don't know. Like it, to me, the word insufficient just sounds like it's not that serious. <laughs> And you say secondary and they're like, okay, secondary. Okay, secondary. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, okay, no, that's not. Okay. So, but he, he had, when, as soon as we get a diagnosis of anything in our lives that we've ever had to encounter medically, um, he does research. And so I think that he had seen um, one of your videos because he showed it to me and, but I, I didn't, I wasn't aware and awake and I didn't care like at that point about anything. And so, but he, he said, I think he was in the ER saying, you can't hurt her. You won't hurt her by giving her steroids because you said that in a video. I did say that in a video I did. And that came from um, a paramedic that was here that saw a video of a mom saying those words stuck with her. So I say them in the video saying, like you can't hurt her by giving her shit. You can hurt her by not giving them her steroids. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, um, so that was that. I spent four days in the hospital. They did taper me down, which I I don't know that was necessary at this point. But and they did test my cortisol. But after they gave me that um, solucorta, right. so I had a hundred milligrams of hydrocortisone when they finally gave it to me, and then they drew bloods after that, and my cortisol was thirty two. So. <laughs> better high than low I say some days right we need to have those spikes sometimes we can't control and so so they did 100 milligrams every eight hours and then 50 milligrams every eight hours and then when we got down to 25 they said to go to 25 or 20 milligrams twice a day or something and that's when they sent me home um and And I want everyone I want everyone to keep in mind too as they're listening to I just love the energy that's in your voice and the confidence and stuff like this girl just went through this like six eight weeks ago (laughs) yeah it was december 3rd was when i went to the hospital right so this is very reason this 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 scary new situation um this learning curve that i think her husband did an amazing job with knowing her doctors have done an amazing job communicating to you guys the importance of the steroids um i just i just love your confidence and you know what we dealt with this and we got through it and this is what we're we're going through and um, it's just incredible to know that it, it's just happened so, so very recently for you. Yeah, well, that's kind of my approach to life. That was my approach to cancer as well, is that I, I believe that we sign up for the challenges that we face in life and we don't, we don't have the benefit of knowing why, yeah. <laughs> um, but I do believe it was our choice to come here. And um And so I, I basically approached cancer as this is just the chapter I'm on now. And for whatever reason, I wanted to come here and experience this. And I don't think it's the cancer and I don't think it's the chemo. And I don't think it's the adrenal insufficiency that I wanted to experience. It's whatever's going to come next. And so I feel like we need to kind of keep that in mind. And I find it helpful to look at the world that way, because otherwise it's so easy to get stuck and bogged down in the in the oh my god why is this happening to me <laughs> like you said we, we like, all we this all have, happening to me now why we is all this have those moments where we feel that way especially when you're doing dealing with something that 
involves hormones <laughs> and chemicals <laughs> going into your body. They can mess with your head. They can make you feel really awful some days and make you think thoughts that you think, ah, oh, you know, the, the regular me wouldn't think, think this way, but for some reason today I am. And it's just knowing that it's, um, it's part of our journey and do your best not to make your heart harder and to find, to find the light wherever it, it's guiding you to, because, you know, your first 15 years of um, autoimmune struggles, a carnivore diet that helped you eat more nutritionally, helped you lose weight helped you find cancer my body was stronger to fight that cancer yes right 100%. 100%. right right and it's you know maybe those first 15 years were like you said they weren't enjoyable you were in a lot of pain and a lot of discomfort but it's brought you into each chapter stronger and yeah. mentally and physically and i do i recognize it's not helpful to tell somebody who's stuck in why me that you, they should just think positive, like that's just not helpful. And and um, it's not helpful to tell somebody who's getting a cancer diagnosis or an Addison's diagnosis. Yeah. You just have to think positive. Like that's, you can't go from why me to everything is great in, in a heartbeat. You have to, you have to do that slowly. And so um, you need to focus on something that just feels a little bit better. So I f focus on, I watch my dog sleeping. I take lots of pictures of my dog sleeping and lots of pictures on my phone of my dog just sleeping because she's just so cute. <laughs> um, you want to look at the quiet, okay, it's, it's been snowing here. The quiet peacefulness when the snow falls. Even if you don't like the cold, you can appreciate if you go outside when it's snowing, how all of the noise of the world is muted. And that's a beautiful thing. You can focus on um, when I dropped my daughter off at school, I saw the bald eagle. They have a bald eagles nesting on her school property. That's so cool. Every time I see the eagle there, I'm like, oh, the eagle's there. And I get this little burst of excitement. And I try and hold that emotion for a few moments. And, um, you know, the fact that I can stretch today, or I did your birthday yoga the other day. And the fact that I had the energy to even do that. I couldn't do it straight through. I had to take breaks in the middle, but I could do that. And I hadn't done anything active in six weeks, <laughs> eight weeks probably. And um, so you have to focus on just little by little, you train yourself to find something in every hour or in each day that just feels a little bit better than being stuck. And then you'll as you train yourself to look for those things, you'll see more of them. You'll see more of the the positive because that's the law of attraction. If you look for it, you're going to get more of that. Your intention, you, int you have to be intentional with it sometimes, but yeah. it will get easier and then you won't need to be intentional with it. Yeah, I think you're right. It, it's learning to, and like you said, it's a learning curve, step by step. It's taking the ego out of it and just very, just loving yourself. Okay, what do I need right now in this moment? And I think, you know, personally, sometimes where you set too high expectations of what you think your journey should look like, and that's when you cause stress and that's when you feel overwhelmed. And, but if you just, you know, work at being in the moment and like, it doesn't happen overnight, <laughs> right? No. You got you got to work at it. And it's just, but when you do, it's a beautiful thing that can happen into your life and that you can you know, you can give to your family, you can, you know, you, you're teaching your kids how to deal with things just by, you know, simply being in the moment and just kind of letting life happen and, and working with whatever you're working with that day. There's a blue jay on the branch outside my window right now. So look at that, like, oh, look, I'll visit from a blue jay. Yeah, right. <laughs> like it's the world really is a beautiful thing. And when we're dealing with struggles, it's, it's easy to see the dark side of things and there's still there's still a lot more beauty in the world and we have a lot of power over what we're dealing with um if we just kind of take a moment and and look for it mm -hmm. and it seems silly it does seem silly and you know I, i've struggled with this with some of my friends when they're in, when they're stuck in that poor me life sucks kind of a mentality and it's like just you, you know just think about, but think about, and you have to sometimes point it out to them, but think about, we got to have lunch today. Like, isn't that great that our schedules lined up and we both got to come and sit down and have lunch today or, um, you know, something it, it's, it's, 
I don't even know. It's like my mother taught me to always look for the silver lining. And I remember not really knowing what that meant, but she would point out like, okay, well, this is crappy, but look at how we all came together when this horrible thing happened or something like that. And now I find myself having to remind her because my mom's getting older and she's not as happy or as it doesn't come easy to her um, at the moment for her because she's got some medical things going on herself and she's struggling with finding a good doctor. And, you know, it's like she doesn't go anywhere anymore. So she doesn't have any fun that she can focus on. And so it's tough for her to find those moments because she doesn't look outside of where she's stuck. And so sometimes it's just, you don't even have to go for a walk, just go outside yep. just for a minute, go outside, look at the trees, look at the plants, look for a squirrel, watch him gathering his nuts and just like, okay, that squirrel, <laughs> he's living outside in the cold. There aren't any nuts around, but he's still doing it. Yeah. So I could, I could, you know, get through the day. So what is, um, so moving forward with your positive attitude and, and your new chapter that you've, you've walked into, um, where are things looking right now with your cancer treatment, with your adrenal insufficiency? How are you feeling? Are I'm things- feeling pretty good right now. I am, um, on 20 milligrams of hydrocortisone at 6 a.m. before I get out of bed and 10 milligrams at 2 p.m. And then if I have something in the evening, if I want to go out, I, last week I, I had two things. I had two nights in a row. I had a hockey game and then we had a dinner out with friends and I took five milligrams at around 6 p.m. just so that I didn't fall asleep during dinner or during the hockey game. And, and what and what Michelle just mentioned that she does, it took me, I think probably about, no one told me about that uh, when I was diagnosed and put on, when I started on hydrocortisone pills. And I learned that through trial and error is that if I stayed up late or if I had things going on in the evening, I always dipped. And I very quickly learned and spoke to my doctor that, you know what, yeah, I have something going on in the evening. It, it's okay to take a little bit of extra hydrocortisone. Or if I knew I was staying up past my bedtime, I'm usually in bed by 10, but we're going out, we're going to be out till midnight or one o'clock in the morning. You know what? It's a regular human with adrenal glands is going to be producing more cortisol to get through the night. And I need to take that through medication. So we need to learn um, with our medical team how to adjust that for ourselves. So yeah, six weeks into this, you know, you've had amazing doctors, great advocates. Um, You've already learned that about dosing. Um, I believe you already have an injection kit and all that stuff set up. And I have, yeah. So the um, hospital, the endocrinology team at the hospital, when they discharged me, discharged me with two injections. And then when I had my first appointment the next day with the endocrinologist, she also prescribed two injections, which they had to wait for insurance. They had to wait a month, but okay, I got that as well. So I now have four injections. So I know there's a shortage. They told me there was a shortage. Another thing to watch for, which I thought was really, I ha- you just have to laugh, is that when I got my injections the first time, the pharmacy gave me one milliliter syringes. There are two milliliters of liquid in a solucortef um, vial. So you need a three ml syringe in order to draw it out and, and get the right dosage. So I had to go back to the pharmacist and be like, what am I going to do with this? Inject it, use it twice. You're not supposed to do that. Like, <laughs> so I thought that was funny. So you have to, you still have to check what they give you. Um, but we do have uh, two full kits with two injections each yeah. in them so that I'm always carrying that with me. I have a, an ID um, tag on my Apple watch and I did order an actual, like a pretty <laughs> a medical ID bracelet as well. Um, that hasn't come in yet, but that, that that's coming too. So I'll have that. And then they also, I saw on Amazon, they have um, like rubber ones, like the, like the live strong bands that say adrenal insufficiency. So I think I'm, I, I have those on my wish list because I want to have those when we go on vacation. Like if, if we're swimming, (laughs) 
I want to have that. It's very bright colored. And you know so what? That's, a, that's a great idea. People who are, I'm not a swimmer, but yeah, to have something like that, like the, the, the bands that are going to be more durable in the water, you can just slide it, slide it on, go in the water, take it off when you're finished with it. And well, we scheduled our discovery cove visit. So if you haven't been to swim with the dolphins, I highly recommend. <laughs> You know, and I just love that. Yeah, that you, you're making plans already. Like you have this and you're like, yeah, get out of my way, life. I'm going to enjoy the beautiful things in life. And this is what I want to do with or, you know, with adrenal insufficiency. I'm going to, I'm figuring out a way. Here's my, I just made a note of um, all the things that you were kind of talking about that, that you have coming in to manage your adrenal insufficiency. I wrote it down as your, your power to do list. Like, you know, yeah. here's my power to do list. And you know what, I'm going to knock them off one by one because I still, I'm going into this chapter and I'm going to live this chapter with adrenal insufficiency. We don't have a choice, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Can, so you can't say, nope, not doing it. <laughs> I'll see you later. You can't yeah. do that. It's like you, you either, you either do it with it or you don't do those things anymore. And that's not acceptable to me. And there are some things that probably I'll think twice about. I'll think yeah. if I really need to do it. Yes. Uh, because like, I don't know. And it, this is really hard for me. It's a paradigm shift for me to say I am dependent on medication. And if I feel a little off to take a pill is not in my paradigm because I was getting off of my meds. Now I'm back up to those levels, by the way. Um, hydrocortisone does contribute to GERD, <laughs> um, re gastric reflux. And so I have gone back up to my pre-carnivore levels of pantoprazole. And I'm going to talk to my doctor about that. Like, I, but is there another brand? Is there another form of, is prednisone better than hydrocortisone? I don't know. But uh, I don't want to be on pantoprazole at that level forever. Yeah. And then um, you, you had talked about even exploring about getting the infusion pump too. Like I <laughs> use that some of us use for it because then it's going to bypass your GI system and all that stuff. And exactly. yeah, and the difference between um, the medication for adrenal insufficiency, you need it to stay alive, <laughs> yes. right? Where the other stuff is more managing symptoms and comfort and stuff like that, where, you know, without, without your steroids now, you're going to go into crisis and, and have And that's something yeah. that you don't know what's going to trigger it. And so, yes. um, you know, I had a stomach ache a, a couple of weeks ago and I just didn't feel, I, it was dinner time. I wasn't hungry. I had a little stomach ache and I just thought it was, it was after a couple of days after chemo. And I said, I was constipated because the chemo was constipating. And I'm like, I think it's just constipation. And I don't, I just don't feel well. It was, it was, um, I had gone for hydration that day. So we did the last two chemos that we did, we did, um, hydration with it and hydration twice after. So a chemo was on Tuesday. I had a liter of fluids on Tuesday. I came back on Friday and had a liter of fluids and the following Monday or Tuesday, I went back for another liter of fluids. And they also reduced the dose of the medication, the chemo meds by 20%. And we stopped Keytruda. So that was what we did. I finished chemo. My last chemotherapy was December 26th. So I'm done. Um, I had an MRI of my breast and there is no evidence of a tumor. That's so the, the, the biopsy clip is there and there is not a tumor next to it. I do still have to have surgery. They need to take that tissue out because they say that the, the um, cell is still there and it can grow back if you don't okay. remove it. So the tumors, when they die, they collapse. They say they um, crumble like a cookie. Okay. So all that stuff is still there, usually contained within the cell. So okay. they'll take the biopsy clip and all of the tissue around it. Um, it's treated as a partial mastectomy or a breast reduction. Okay. And so I have surgery scheduled for the end of January for that side. And then and the lymph nodes in that area as well, because it had spread to the lymph nodes. So it was um, stage three. Okay. So they're going to take out three lymph nodes. Again, there's no evidence of a tumor there either but they're going to take those out. They're going to look at them under their microscope while I am on the table. And if there is any evidence of cancer, they're going to take the rest of that lymph tissue. Okay. If there is no evidence of cancer, they're going to leave the rest in there. So I still have normal lymph drainage. Um, and then after that surgery heals, I will have radiation. They say that the radiation after the fact takes your 
chance of survival or chance of recurrence from 27 or from 27 percent down to four percent i think okay. is what she did so that's that's good that's yeah. a good reduction okay, yeah. fine we'll do the radiation yeah. then too whatever <laughs> I can't remember, like, why? Why do we need to do it? If there's no evidence of a tumor, why do we need to do that? I want to know. So that's why. Yeah. Uh, I don't want it to come back. I don't want to go through this again. And so we'll go ahead and do everything we, they tell me that we need to do. I am also, by the way, seeing a naturopath, a chiropractor. I have a functional medicine doctor on standby. I'm also treating this from a natural perspective, but I'm doing that with the conventional medicine. And the naturopath and the functional medicine doctor both told me with triple negative breast cancer, if I did not do the chemo, it didn't matter what they did, I would be dead in five years. Wow. And so that's why I yeah. agree. Cause if you, and, and that, and I have, I have two kids and a husband that I don't, I'm not ready to leave them. Yes. So, um, you know, it's like, okay, I'll do the key. They're like, you do the chemo and then we will support you and we yeah. will bring your body back after. Yeah. So we're going to also see what the functional medicine doctor says about adrenal insufficiency, but we're not there yet. We're focused on still finishing up cancer. We're going to do the surgery, the radiation, and then they'll do the surgery on the other side, the reconstructive surgery to make them match. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> so that's how cancer finishes up. Um, I, again, I'm still talking. I have an endocrine, my next endocrinology appointment is on the 22nd. And I have lots of questions like the infusion pump or a different perhaps form of steroid to see if we can mm -hmm. get off the other meds again, but <laughs> yeah. And learning how, you know, to get through surgery now, um, like I said, it's great that you have a, a great medical team that's going to take you through, you know, making sure your steroids are going to support you through surgery and, and through the stress of the radiation that's going to come afterwards. And and all that stuff as well. So I would love like, you know, in the next few months when, you know, your chapter starts to turn more pages, <laughs> I would love to have you back on to let us know how that was managed and how you were feeling through it. And, um, and just, you know, yeah, just how, how the cortisol responded, because it's going to be a different story now, because you're going into this, knowing what's going on and having to adjust and figure that out as you go. Yeah. And, uh, I know the endocrinologist says when we're all the way through on the other side, my daily meds will probably be lower than they are now. Right. Yeah. That and makes both sense. surgeons. So I have an, um, uh, the breast oncologist surgeon, the surgical oncologist, and I also have a plastic surgeon. They're both going to be in the operating room. Both of them have had experience with this. Okay. I'm not the first Good. that this has happened to in this cancer practice. So they have done breast surgery before on someone with adrenal insufficiency. And the breast surgeon actually said that they've had it both ways. They've had it where they've had someone that they were able to plan ahead. And they also had it happen where somebody kind of crashed on the table yep. and they were able to manage and yep. recognize that that's what was happening yep. and give stress steroids at the time when the person was not yet diagnosed. So okay. I'm pretty okay. confident in the team and their ability to manage it. This oh. is normally an outpatient surgery, but mine will be inpatient because they are recognizing that they're going to need to stress dose me and they're going to need to monitor me when I wake up. Oh, that's amazing. And you know, and the great thing about steroids is when they recognize what's going on and they give it to you, they work pretty darn quick usually. And they within can- Within an hour? <laughs> within, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, she was almost, you know, dead a little bit ago and now look at her she's you know knitting a blanket like you know like it's, yes it's, it's, it's and they gave me that out. shot in the emergency room within an hour my blood pressure was 120 over 80 yeah. and I was asking for food I'm like yeah. where is can I eat like and and you know from an outsider's perspective it's it's very um I, would, I don't know the words confusing it's like two different worlds right it's like but you just said she was like but now we're way over here in such a short period of time but but that's exactly what happened so that's why you can't hurt us by giving us steroids you you save our lives and and um and you can feel yourself coming back into your body in that hour you can feel yourself returning to life and it's mm -hmm. it's a very unique experience <laughs> that's for sure yeah. Very, like, very ready unique. to go home. Like, yeah, right. why am I still here? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, you know, an hour ago, you could barely breathe and then you clean your house. 
because you have so much energy and you're wide awake. Right. So, um, no, so that's incredible. So you have surgery coming up and again, um, I just love the confidence that's in your voice. You're just kind of like, you know what, let's get in there let's get it done and, and let's, let's move on with this. So, um, so is there anything else part of your journey that you would like to share with us or anything that you see coming up in the future? I think we covered all the bullet points I, I wrote down. <laughs> okay, good. I always want to make sure that I do that with everybody. Um, yeah, Michelle, I think your story is absolutely, absolutely amazing, especially, you know, you touched on so many great things. Um, you know, just, just the simple things, like you said, you have like an Apple watch. If you don't have anything like that, they're, they're great tools, getting some type of watch so that you can monitor your, your, um, your heart rate a little bit. And you have a little bit of an idea of what's going on. The more things, the more tools that we can learn to use that we can manage, it really does help. It really does make a difference. Um, I love your power to do list. So that's something I really recommend all of our, our um, listeners to do. If you don't have a little power to do list, look at what your you need right now for the lifestyle that you want to live. And, you know, I kind of call it going at the Addison's pace, the Addy pace, because you know what, it might take us a little bit longer to get to that life that we want to live. But if we keep working at that to-do list and finding ways um, to, to mark off that power to-do list, you're going to slowly get back that quality of life. And I wrote down one, one thing that you said, and you, you said it a couple, um, couple different ways while while we were recording this podcast and you sharing your story um but at the very start you use the words you're just like that doesn't work for me yeah you know what like hey you know what I you know what feeling like this that just does not work for me and you can hear that throughout your whole story where you're just like you know what this isn't working for me I'm gonna find a way around it okay you put this in front of me and I'm, I'm gonna climb this hurdle and um I'm going on with my life because I want to swim with the dolphins and I want to spend time with my kids and my husband and, and, I, and I'm not leaving here yet. So, um, so thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. I truly enjoyed it. And I know our li listeners have gotten a lot out of it as well. And I also wrote down, you wrote, you just have to laugh. <laughs> you just have to laugh. Some days, you know what, some days you just have to laugh at, you know what, the pharmacist messed up, <laughs> you know, like, you know, I got the one mil vials and it just doesn't make sense. And it is, and again, it's just another little reminder that, um, you know, everyone's human and we still need to do our best to educate ourselves. And if we're not somebody who can, you know, some people just don't have interest or the knowledge to do their meds and stuff like that. Find somebody in your life that can do it for you to double check these things for you and um, find whatever your comfort zone is, because we need to follow up. We need to know what's going on. And it's just part of, it's just part of the chapter that we're all in together now. And again, yeah. you sharing your story. Um, I love that part of like when we, you talked about the positive attitude and, and the mindset and everything like that. Stuff like this that I find is so important. People coming on the podcast like you to share your story. And I appreciate it so much because sometimes just somebody feeling not alone, even if it's just for a few moments or you heard something in Michelle's story where you're like, oh, you know what? I've gone through that and you know what she got through it and you know what I can do it too that can be magic that can be those little things like seeing the blue jay and watching the squirrel with the nuts and the, the stillness of the snow those sometimes are little things that that can change your day and so Michelle I thank you so much for coming on the podcast today and I would love 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 in the next few months um, for you to come back on and share more of your journey and, and give us an update as well. Absolutely. And I do have, I did start a YouTube channel, not oh, right. because yes. I want to be an influencer, but I did just to document my, it was started out as documenting my cancer journey so that every time friends or family said, how are you doing? I could say, go watch the latest video because <laughs> it explained everything from that week. So it's called A Refined Me. So A R E F I N E D M E is my YouTube kind of tag. And that's because my business, my dog training business is a refined canine. So, or the refined canine. So I it just made it about me. Yep. And so that will now probably I'll do updates about this. Um, again, I'm, I'm not an influencer, but I have noticed that I'm getting more subscriptions yep. and people are like co commenting on my videos that I don't know who they are. Yep. So people are sharing it. So even from the cancer side of things, I mean, my, my hair video, like the video about losing my hair, that one went like, I got like over 2000 views. So oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Good for you. That's awesome. 
Um, and I will make sure I put the link for your YouTube channel in the, sh um, the show notes as well too, so that people can find it too, but no, that would be amazing. And then we can kind of track you over the next people get an update and watch your, your, the videos that are there now. And if you post, when you post stuff, um, coming up in the next few months, that would be incredible to watch. Yeah, I think I will. I think the, the, my experience in the ER where the doctors didn't even really know what we meant when we said adrenal insufficiency, it just kind of illustrates that. Yeah. A lot of knowledge needs to get out there from everybody that can share it. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? And that's what's great about social media is that we have this free resource now that we can do that where people for so many years lived. They all not only felt alone, they were really truly alone in whatever they were going through and they couldn't touch base with anybody. And now we have the power to do that. And when, and when, you know what, when you're going through cancer treatment, when you have adrenal insufficiency, you know, sometimes we don't travel outside of our homes very much. <laughs> so to right. have access just by clicking a button or going on your phone, um, yeah, it can be magic. It can be life-changing. Yeah. So, so thank you for what you do as well. Cause I think that your podcast and your YouTube channel definitely helped to educate me about what was happening to me. So, well, thank you. I appreciate that so much. And it is, it's kind of, yeah, I think um, I think when you go through something um, through life, you know what that magic is. And it's just trying to give just a little bit of that magic back to people into the, the world. And um, it, it seems to be doing that. So thank you very much. So um, so, Michelle, good luck on your next chapter. And um, I look forward to hearing it, hearing more about it and, and watching your journey and being more inspired by you as time goes by. So thank you so much. Thank you, too. All right. Well, thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Pickle Jar podcast. So I will put Michelle's uh, YouTube channel in the show notes for you. Um, and if not, and if you're listening to this podcast, you can always go on and on my YouTube channel as well, Chronically Fit Canada, and watch the version there as well and some other videos. So if you're interested in being a guest and sharing some of your magic here in the Pickle Jar, please send me an email at thepicklejar at rogers.com, or you can go to my website, chronicallyfitcanada.com and chronicallyfitcanada.com where you can sign up for a little get to know you chat too where we can discuss you sharing your story here in the pickle jar so thank you so much for listening and until next time please be well my pickles <laughs>